welcome everyone. Um, welcome to, I guess it's fifth week, right? I assume in the in the Oxford term calendar, but hopefully uh, we'll remedy your fifth week blues as um, we've been, well, I think we're all really lucky to have uh, Kurush AK, as he's uh, known as on Twitter and YouTube, um, crypto trader and market meditator. I'll uh, hand over. To, <laughs> I'll hand over to Fergus to uh, do the formal introduction because uh, thanks to Fergus, who's essentially helping us run the the finance side of the blockchain society and you know get people into trading and stuff like that. Um, he you know essentially reached out to Karush and Karush uh, thankfully said yeah, gave us a thumbs up. So over to you, Fergus, for the introduction. Thank you, Brandon. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you especially to. Um, to Karish joining us, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. Um, for those of you who don't know, Karish is uh, an independent um, cryptocurrency trader, um, investor and educator. Um, he has his own newsletter and podcast called um, Market Meditations, which you know focuses on cryptocurrency news, market updates, and analysis. And he has uh, quickly amassed over 100,000 followers uh, on Twitter, um, which is a testament to his, to his, um, to his skills. Um, just quickly before we start, we're going to have to uh, just give a little disclaimer and say that, you know, everything that's going to be said today is, uh, is opinion and shouldn't be taken as financial advice. Um, so, Karish, um, before we you know, start to talk about the markets themselves, why don't you tell us a bit about how you kind of uh, first discovered crypto, uh, your background and what sort of led you to becoming a successful trader? Well, uh, firstly, thanks for having me here, everyone. This is uh, really exciting, actually, um, because we, we do the YouTube live streams with uh, loads of people watching, but I haven't actually done these small, uh, more concentrated groups of people who are just super passionate about cryptocurrencies, and I love to see it. And also, uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A, just to hear loads of British accents, because, guys, I speak to US people all day long. So, yeah, just looking forward to hearing more of that UK accent. Uh, but, yeah, guys, so um, I got involved in cryptocurrency, much like like many of you probably did in 2017, uh, dived into it uh, because my friend was involved in the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. I'm not sure if you guys remember that, but he told me, hey, Ethereum's coming. It's like the new internet. You should dive into this. And well, I was doing business, going from business to business at that time, uh, working on whatever ventures sounded cool. And I really trusted this guy, he knew his stuff. So dived in, bought some Ethereum and my $50 portfolio went to $150. So I'm like, okay, time to quit my job. A few more years of this and I'm gonna overtake Warren Buffett. <laughs> and yeah, dived into the euphoria of 2017. Uh, luckily I'd actually done uh, quite a bit of investing up until this point. And my mindset was, okay, passive investing is the only thing that works. Um, trading and making money trading, it doesn't make sense because, well, if you keep making these percentage percentage returns consistently day after day, well, exponentially that's going to grow and eventually you'll become really, really rich. So it can't work. Mathematically, that didn't make sense to me. But as you dive deeper into it, you see there are a lot of layers to it. You can't actually grow these portfolios indefinitely. And there are loads of edges in the market, despite um, firms spending, I don't know, like 200 million just to get a 0.5% edge on order execution. You still can succeed as a retail trader because there are sweet spots sweet spots in liquidity, sweet spots where it's just not worth the time of bigger plays to look into it. And well, I discovered this through chatting with loads of people, learning through Twitter, YouTube, and eventually went from passive investor closer and closer to an active trader. And with that pessimistic um, mathematical humility behind me, I did consistently take profit all the way through 2017 um, and luckily came out with most of my profits. And that's how I got involved in crypto. The social media side after 2017, I noticed everyone was talking about how bad the bear market is and not that many people were still succeeding through it. But heck guys, I was doing using some trading strategies that worked, some of them disgustingly well because well, price was going down and the strategies were playing with the trend. You keep shorting the market as it's going down and you do pretty well, despite the number not purely going up. So I decided to start sharing my trades live. Actually, I grew a, I think it was nothing crazy, like a 30 K portfolio to about 45 K live. And that's how I started my account. 
and then people started following then the following got to like 2000 and yeah that's when it started to get a little scary because anything i'd share everyone would copy me except they didn't use the stop loss um they upped the leverage up to 100x and suddenly if i was talking about a small coin it would actually move when i talk about it so i had to stop sharing it live and kind of swap to just shit posting and drawing charts and just doing whatever I wanted for like three years. And then only recently I decided, okay, guys, let's take this really seriously because um, the crypto space is now really matured. There's a big following right now. Um, we've been putting out some decent education content. We've got a loyal brand. And that's when I started to get really involved in the space, working closely with projects. Right now I'm an advisor to multiple. I'm still actively trading, though not as much. I'm focusing more on the investment side, um, networking throughout the space, educating new folks and making it more accessible to the regular person. And yeah, that's a little bit of an all over the place introduction, but hopefully answers the question, Fergus. Yeah, that's great. You've mentioned a lot of things that I uh, that I think we can come back to later. Um, you know, you talked about you know, passive income, developing your edge, uh, profit taking, and all the way through. So we'll, we'll definitely come back to some of those later. Um, to start with, I think you know we should we 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 should talk about the market right now because obviously it's going crazy. You know, we've got Bitcoin all time high yesterday again, breaking fifty k. Um, Ethereum all time high today. Um, so just you know, obviously we're all we're all long term bullish here for the most part. But uh, what what is your kind of opinion on this on this current price action? You know, do you do you see you know any signs of uh, you know overheating? Because you know, on the one hand, we've got this kind of parabolic move that we've had all year, um, and you know, there's potentially signs of greed kind of starting to creep into the market. But then equally, sort of the fundamental argument for Bitcoin is as, as strong as it's ever been. So how do you sort of see those forces balancing out, and what's your kind of overall opinion on price action at the moment so there's two ways to really look at the market generally it's uh, most people will take either a fundamental perspective or a technical perspective uh, but what works really well when things get overheated is looking at the narratives uh, and this is so simple it's painful like in 2017 the narrative was is this going to be the new ethereum or is this going to be the new whatever uh, take a look at ICX. Do you guys, does anyone remember ICX? I don't know if we've got um, hand sub feature or anything, but ICX went about a 120 or a thousand X from ICO. I can't remember exactly what it was simply because it was the Korean Ethereum. Then the narrative for the next, um, the Chinese Ethereum was NEO or back then it was called Anchez and then it became NEO and these coins went parabolic. This year, it's shifted a bit, a bit. Right now, it's highly focused on DeFi and NFTs. The reason I'm talking about these narratives, if you will, is because uh, the more overheated we get, the less the fundamentals and technicals actually tend to matter. And purely taking a step back and looking at it from a macro perspective, uh, we've got a lot stronger fundamentals and actual products with use cases right now. So it feels a lot more solid. And generally these sorts of cycles, the first one is very aggressive and very quick. The next one often tends to take a lot longer. And then even though it takes longer, it will not go up as high. So comparing the two cycles, it looks like you'll get to I don't know, about 100 to 300K. That's a wild random range. No one knows exactly where the top is, but it feels a bit too early right now for it to really top out. And interest is still flooding in. From like an insider's perspective, guys, right now, I get celebrities in my DMs asking for access to special deals or offers in the crypto market. I mean, it's stupid, but people are still flooding in attention. Interest is coming in. Every week you hear about a new billionaire or company that's got um, Bitcoin on their balance sheet. So it doesn't feel close to the top right now. I think it's a question you're going to ask later, but it's less about figuring out where the top is and more about just consistently taking profits throughout. Yeah, so you obviously you mentioned you know DeFi and NFTs, and we'll and we'll come to them. We'll come to them soon. Just you know focusing on this this idea, the narrative right now, it, it, it's very much focused on this institutional inflow of money um, into Bitcoin. We you know we've seen Microsoft lead that, and now Tesla Tesla joining. Um, so what do you think that you know? What do you think um, we're going to continue to see in in regards to institutional demand? Do you think that you know Bitcoin and cryptos is is, is starting to be accepted as kind of its like 
own distinguished asset class? Um, do you think that maybe Bitcoin has a chance of kind of, you know, potentially toppling gold in the next, sort of the next 10 years? And um, yeah, so what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Every time a new billionaire or institution enters, it kind of gives uh, the green light the okay for the young employee at a company to come up and say, hey guys, I think we should take on a Bitcoin strategy. And uh, the more profit people make from it, the more FOMO comes in. Because remember, the people running these companies, they're all human. Uh, the, the more they see other people do it successfully, the more they want to get involved. And there's a fundamental thing most people are missing is the actual immense marketing benefits of taking Bitcoin on as a company. Like you, you guys, I'm sure you're all pretty active on social media. Anyone who mentions anything about Bitcoin is getting a lot of media attention right now that all over the news, they get the love of the small cultish following of the cryptocurrency group because there are cult-like behaviors happening in cryptocurrencies right now. You say anything negative about Bitcoin and people will hate you. Like uh, Bill Gates didn't even say something negative about Bitcoin the other day. He just said um, he went from not liking it to neutral. I think that's what the statement was. And uh, I tweeted about it um, from the Market Meditations account and the comments hated it because he wasn't vehemently bullish on it. And that's a very cult-like mentality happening with regards to it. But the benefits come where like Elon Musk is loved right now by the community. He's going viral. Same with Michael Saylor. Who knew who Michael Saylor was before he bought Bitcoin? So any company that brings it onto their balance sheet, it doesn't matter how small, like because uh, if you buy say a billion and you're a huge company, it could be less than 0.5% or less than maybe even 0.1% of your company. But you can market that as we just bought a billion dollars of Bitcoin and put it on our balance sheets. So there is more and more benefit to do it. And there's a benefit to act fast. Um, looking back at the dot-com bubble, it's kind of like any company that puts dot-com at the end of their name, the share prices go up, everything goes well for them. So there is a lot of incentive from that perspective to put it on your balance sheet. And then the narrative to whether or not it's going to replace gold, uh, that's a much more difficult one because it has the potential in theory, but whether or not it's going to be allowed to do that has a plethora of risks. We've got regulatory risk is the biggest one I'd be looking out for because uh, for it to act as that store of value, I mean, it's really got to be accepted. And if you've got that huge risk that the government can just take it away from you or ban it. I mean, we saw it recently in the UK, you and I were talking about this before the chat, they just came up and banned um, derivative trading, the FCA. So you're not allowed to market it to retail people um, and you can't do derivative trading because it could hurt people with, what was it, 50 million worth of damage to the country. And then I brought the point up that they're not doing that with stock trading. Um, they're still allowed to advertise casinos on football players' shirts and all over the stadiums, but 50 million worth of damage from crypto derivatives doesn't make sense. And it just brings up the point that you can get that regulatory risk at any time. So it's still a little bit away from really being able to do what gold does. So, yeah. So moving forward then, you know, you, you, you talk about these risks and you were mentioning earlier about how, you know, we had the bigger cycle and now the smaller cycle. And now you, you mentioned how there's these incentives for these institutions to start buying Bitcoin. Do you, do you think that with all of these forces coming together, you know, it, it kind of, arguably going mainstream now, do you think that we have kind of the chance of seeing a sort of super cycle? Because in the past, we've had these very sort of predictable um, four year cycles that kind of kind of work like like clockwork um, for Bitcoin. Do you think that that, you know, sort of continues or do you think it maybe slightly starts to go out the window as we start to just see a sort of slow, less volatile, gradual climb up um, in the coming years? So I'm always hesitant to make predictions about Bitcoin because we've got such a small sample size of data to go off of. And not only is it a small sample size of data, but the market participants are so vastly different at each stage uh, that they're almost difficult to compare to each other. And also think about the level of innovation in the space as well, that the, the use cases are changing by the day. Like um, a few years ago, no one knew that DeFi was going to be the next step, like the next thing that's going to come out. Like it wasn't in the conversation in 2017. Did anyone talk about DeFi? It wasn't even in the conversation. And now it's everywhere. 
So it's really difficult to predict what is going to happen next and whether or not we're going to see this giant super cycle. And I don't think it's useful to do either because it really is just trying to guess the price. And why would you try to guess the price? Well, because we're all traders, investors, uh, we want to make money. Uh, I mean, guessing the price definitely isn't about the tech. And the point of guessing the price is to try to guess the top. The point of guessing the top is to try and make as much money as possible, which all comes back to, you just need to know how to take profit. I mean, I was talking with uh, Jason Troy today. He's part of the Spartan Group. I don't know if you guys know it, but it's crazy that a company called the Spartan Group is a hedge fund managing $200 million in assets right now, but welcome to crypto. Uh, so shouting to him and did you literally say, we've got no idea where the top is. All we do is consistently take profit um, using our own measures for taking profit. So they enter an investment, they have a thesis, and then they take profit when their thesis plays out and they reach their target. They After that, it's over. You don't care where the top is. And that's why I'm not really giving an answer to where's the top. I'm just talking about why would you want to know where's the top and what can you do with that information? Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. Um, just coming back to the first part of your answer, you're talking about, about DeFi. Um, what, what do you think of where DeFi is going? You know, do you, and, and what, what are the best ways of taking advantage? You know, we were talking before about, about yield farming and, uh, you know, sort of passive, passive income from DeFi. Do you think that's something that's going to go uh, sort of more mainstream? Or do you think the focus will be more on investing in the DeFi projects? So this is something I was really late to because remember guys, I'm a trader or an investor. I, I'm not really, well, previously wasn't really diving into the tech. And in fact, this year hired a team to last year now, last year, like COVID makes this time, uh, times go by quickly. Um, last year, hired a team to actually help inform my decisions on this. Uh, there's a research team that vets and looks into any project I want to instantly. And that's because I recognize my weakness there and I want to gain more information. So with DeFi right now, there are huge opportunities. And this was really difficult for me to accept because um, I've always programmed my brain to say, if there's risk, there's going to be correlated reward. So um, if, you, if you're earning 5%, you're probably holding an asset that's less risky than the stock market. If you're earning 30%, well, you're probably taking on a lot of risk right now because I don't know, passively in the stock market, you could get about 8%, then take that up to 100% or 1,000%, which you do in crypto. And then there's these DeFi protocols out there that are telling me all I have to do is deposit my USD and you're going to pay me out 20%. So twice what I'd get in the stock market didn't make sense to me that there was no risk. So I actually got people, again, I keep, I'm not trying to shill my podcast, but I got um, someone on my podcast, um, a lot of people recently to start talking about DeFi and learning more about that. And your biggest risk, the number one risk you take on in DeFi and you mentioned passive income. Remember, DeFi isn't the only option. There are a lot of places you can earn passive income um, is lending your money it's always over collateralized. So there really isn't much risk from there. Your only risk is the code breaking down and it can happen. And it, it, the code's been audited again and again. I'm not a computer, um, I'm not a developer or a programmer, but I'm sure a lot of you have experience there. And I've got a lot of friends who are deep into that space. You know how easily one little thing can go wrong. And then if you exploit that, well, it, it can all turn um, to shit really. So that's the biggest risk you're taking on. Besides that, I mean, there's just a huge amount of demand for it. And because the demand is so high, the returns are there. And you're taking the risk um, of using this untested, at least time-wise, software. And there's also the barrier to entry because the average person can't navigate these platforms. I mean, Uniswap alone, it's not easy to use. I don't know how many people in here are traders, but it's difficult to get onto Uniswap and actually execute your first trade. And there's the other barrier to entry right now, which is the Ethereum gas fees. I mean, if it costs you, um, I'm sorry, it's been up, as, up to like $300 sometimes. If it costs you $300 to send your money over, then another $300 to start lending it. And then anytime you want to take it out, you've got, you would need to start off with over 10 grand just to start touching it, um, probably a lot more because $300 is a significant amount when you're playing with those sorts of sums. So those are the reasons you can earn such high um, returns uh, without taking on quote unquote traditional risk. 
so there are other places as well. I don't know how deep you want me to go into the passive income side of things, Fergus, but um, I'll stop there to see if you have any follow-up questions. Yeah, I think we can keep the focus on DeFi for now. So you talk about these barriers to entry. Um, what, where do you think it will go in terms of in terms of becoming mainstream? Do you think these barriers to entry will be will be breaking down anytime soon? I mean, we saw the whole kind of um, GameStop saga and the the role of Wall Street bets, and and then obviously the response of Robin Hood, which was to suspend the trading. Do you think that kind of almost act as a bit of an advert for DeFi? Um, and do you think that going forward, there's going to be a sort of a transition towards decentralized finance? Everyone in crypto was um, celebrating when that was happening because it really highlights the corruption and inefficiency in the space right now. The fact that you can just switch on a pause button, that the biggest people, the um, hedge funds could switch on a pause button. Uh, re reposition themselves and then restart the game. To put that into context, it's like playing a game of chess with someone and then pausing the game, repositioning the pieces to where you want them to be, and then restarting it. And that really shows the uh, issue here alongside transparency. Right now, private hedge funds don't show people what they're doing. So anything going on behind the scenes, we can't see. What decentralization does is it makes it all out in the open. Will it completely get rid of corruption? Of course not. There's going to be all sorts of ways to still exploit it, but you will be transparent. It is a step in the right direction. And whether or not it gets adopted, well, we're heading in the right direction right now. And the thing which really pushes it forward is the fact that it is a more efficient um, product. It is a better infrastructure. I am 95% bankless right now, guys. I have 5% of my net worth in a bank. Uh, okay, I hold stock funds, but they don't count. Um, so 95% uh, of my wealth is online. If I wanna borrow money, I don't have to go to a bank. I don't have to fill out forms. I don't have to uh, go through any process besides click one button on a slightly difficult to use exchange. So that's where we are right now. So for almost everyone in this chat, you are capable of using that and shifting towards that. And why wouldn't you when it's easier, more convenient and more profitable? Uh, now, the issue comes with say the older generations where they don't want to take that sort of risk. If there's any risk that you could click the wrong button and lose like a significant sum of money, you're not going to do that. You're not going to touch that. Also, most people don't even want to learn. They're like they don't believe it. They're like me, paranoid. I'm deep in the cryptocurrency space. And when I see 30% returns from DeFi immediately, I'm like, I'm not touching that. That's why I slept on it for way too long while my friends are making disgusting amounts of money off of getting in early. And then um, I'm just sitting there FOMOing on the sides. So like, it, it is crazy. It looks like a scam. It sounds like a scam. And um, the UI isn't there yet. But there are loads of developers in the space right now. People are flooding in. For my own company, I'm, I'm literally we're poaching employees right now from top firms because they want to jump into crypto. They're excited by it. They love, one, the, the money's attractive. Most people come in for the money. But what you can stay for is the fact that this is liberating technology that really does good things. I mean, that's exciting. That's fun. That's what keeps you going through four years of bear market. Because right now, it's easy to love crypto. It's easy to be interested. But building this stuff afterwards, so to circle it back to your question, yeah, People are flooding in right now. There's more talent coming in. The UI is not where it needs to be, but there are VC funds forming all over the place right now with a five to 10 year horizon. We are shifting in the right direction. Every protocol is growing rapidly. And the fact that it's actually the better option for everyone in this chat right now leads me to believe that yes, unless we get some serious fight back, which in a financial revolution, you likely will, this is the future and this is where the world will shift towards. Yeah. Talking of getting in early, I thought we'd uh, move away from DeFi now and come back to something you mentioned earlier, which was um, NFTs. So could you just maybe give a brief explanation of what, of what NFTs are in case anyone um, is unaware and just kind of give your opinions on, on the current NFT market, where you think it's going, and then maybe if there's any particular sort of NFT projects that you're interested in or use cases, perhaps, uh, perhaps give some insight into that. Um, I'd love to. Okay, so if you guys thought DeFi was a scam, you're going to love this. Uh, so it's like an, an electronic kitty you can buy on the internet, and it costs like two to ten thousand um, dollars. 
it, it you, you don't really own it like people can take a screenshot of it but it, it's yours uh so that's joking aside actual explanation non-fungible tokens guys uh what they do is um they replicate digital scarcity but for any asset you want to put a signature on and uh they are the first way of really putting scarce art on the internet and there's a whole bunch of other use cases you can do for it that's not specifically art for example if someone wanted to start a digital comic book store right now where um sp you can sell spider-man comics but there's a digital signature to say it's yours you can actually claim ownership of this so what nfts do is they allow you to have digital ownership over these products and uh, there's also a whole bunch of use cases and video games as well because uh, you create these unique products that you can claim ownership over um the reason people normally think it's a scam is because well what's the point of claiming ownership over a gif it doesn't really make sense but in the same way like an analogy which really helps me understand it and i haven't touched nfts till recently is imagine uh the mona lisa if i 3d printed an exact replica with no difference whatsoever would you pay the same for that as the original and i think for most people the answer is no and because the answer is no there that's where the value comes in because someone else believes that this has value it creates the value that's it i mean bitcoin's the same thing like the only reason bitcoin has value is because it's a meme everything in the market is a meme we we meme it into um value and existence and it's the same with nfts so there's immense potential there and it's all around innovation right now because i've gave gave you the comic um use case no one's even made that yet that's just an idea me and my friends talk about because it's pretty cool there's a whole bunch of ways you can use this and really, again, like DeFi, make some industry changing moves. And that's where the poten potential is. Right now, I think the asset values are inflated as hell because it's hyped, it's hyped up. I mean, the Batman artist did an NFT not too long ago and that sold for mid six figures, maybe 1.2 mil. I can't remember the exact amount, but these asset values are inflated. Um, there's a few projects I'm interested in, but I've only recently been diving into the NFT space. So I'm not really comfortable recommending them to you guys, uh, especially not as something you should dive into and invest in. But if you want to check out the marketplaces and just understand it a little bit more, there's Rarible and OpenSea. They're two great platforms which you can go check out and learn a little bit more about how they function and work. And also if there are any artists in here, Guys, you build a social media following and then you can monetize off of NFTs. It's a great way to um, work with your audience and help them support you. Uh, there's also some crazy stuff which happens with it. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard about the selfie that sold for $5,000 in the NFT market. So like I said, inflated asset values, but a lot of innovation around here, a lot of unique use cases in gaming and in supporting and giving um, artists individual ownership uh, of their work and an ability to monetize their audience. Great. I'm just conscious of time um, because I know we've got some questions to go through. So I'll, I'm going to move on now just to, to ask you about kind of what it's like to be a day trader. So, you know, just a couple of things I'm uh, thinking of, you know, so what, what kind of skills do, do you need to, to take up that role and what's, what sacrifices um, do you have to make along the way? Uh, you know, for instance, how do you kind of manage having positions open, uh, maybe the leverage, but at the same time sort of uh, living your life and you know, how do you kind of manage your emotions um, through that whole process? Well, great question. Something I have a fair amount of experience in, especially up until this point. Um, so if you want to be a day trader, first the thing I'd say is it's not what most people think it is. Um, it's not working on a beach, opening your laptop up once a day, checking the price for five minutes, opening a position, closing it, and that's, that's your work. The rest you spend chilling or doing whatever you want. It's nothing like that at all. There's a lot more work that goes into it. And um, it's a difficult skill to develop. It's a more difficult skill, I think, to develop the, and a riskier skill to develop than most others out there. There's a rough, I'd say, 90%, sorry, 90% fail rate in uh, learning to trade. And that's because uh, you have to start from scratch. First, you have to teach yourself the easy part. 
And that's the technical analysis. You learn how to read the charts, or if you want to be a different type of trader, you can learn the fundamentals. That is the easiest thing to do. The bit which is actually difficult is learning how to build your trading system with risk management involved. So you build a system that consistent, continually makes you profit by backtesting it. You come up with a hypothesis. You backtest it in the market. You see if it works. Then you start applying that system in real time. And then once you've started applying that system, if you're making money off of it, the more data you get, the more you can um, rely on that system. But then comes the emotional part because you're a human trying to execute this. Unless you build a bot, which is a completely separate side of the market, um, you have to continually be able to do this day in and day out. And remember, upside is unlimited, downside is limited. That means one bad day. For example, I'll leverage a personal example. In 2018, um, I got into a fight with someone very close to me. I was also very hungry. Uh, I then came to my desk, opened a 250K position because I felt like it and just stood there waiting for it to go up so I could make a grand. And if the market crashed in that second, I would have lost like as much as I would have lost. It depends how much it crashed. And that, that's a crypto trade as well. So a 10% crash there and that's like money disappearing like that. So really the slightest emotional mistake, one moment of weakness and you can lose it all. Not to mention that this is a really dopamine filled activity that um, makes you want to bet more. It makes you want to do nothing but stare at the screen, sacrifice other areas of your life. So I start with the negatives. What you need to be a day trader is ridiculous emotional control. You need to be able to systematically play these things out without deviating. You need to be in a market like today, watch your friends make ridiculous amounts of money, taking stupid amounts of risk and still stick to your tested strategy and be able to do that for years. So know what you're getting into if you want to become a trader. Um, know that it is profitable and it's really fun. I mean, like I replaced um, video games with trading because trading is really, really fun. It's a, it's like a game of chess. Um, and the more you dive into it, the more there is to it. I started just looking at technical analysis. Then um, uh, I spoke to a few friends in the space and they told me, listen, you need to start taking advantage of market sentiment. Pay attention to what's happening around you. Look at how people react to different things on social media, start learning the underlying fundamentals of the projects and you'll do a lot better. Then I spoke to more people and they told me, listen, start tracking to narratives. You've done it before, it's worked, start actually doing it, especially in a bull market. So it's this beautiful journey where you can learn a lot more and continually evolve your trading style. As the market changes, you have to change your system because you can't just build a system and expect that to last forever. Alpha decays. And when alpha decays, you start to stop making money. So I guess that's my overall look at day trading. It's a beautiful thing. It's really risky. And it's not something to do for the money because you will make more money becoming a specialized uh, developer and working for a top uh, crypto firm. Uh, you will take on way less risk and the time investment won't be as much. Uh, but if you love the game, if you think it's fun, if you want to dive down the rapid hole, absolutely go do it. But understand that it's not an easy option at all. Great. One final question from me um, before we move on to some from the audience would just be, we, we, we were talking about it um, briefly earlier and you you gave a brief mention as well, which is profit taking, you know, in a in a market like we've got right now, I think that's something that a lot of people probably struggle with is knowing when and probably more importantly, how how to take to take profit. Could you just maybe give give an insight into that? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. And I'm really glad you asked that because um, I I'm so much more passionate about answering questions like this than what do you think Bitcoin's price is going to be in two years? Not that I don't enjoy answering that, but I really do think that's just guesswork and doesn't help anyone. All it does is give people a little bit of hope of, oh, that's where the price is going to do. Um, profit taking is what's really important in a market like this. And uh, the best time to decide when you're taking profit is when you first enter that investment, which ideally is before this sort of market. So you need to have a plan in place before you go in. Now I'll talk about specific types of strategies you can use, but the key thing is to have that plan in place as you enter, because the time to decide when to take profit is not when you feel like a genius and you're high on dopamine because you've just 100 X your portfolio. That is the worst time to decide when to take profit because same with me, I will be under the influence that I'm an absolute genius, that this is going to keep going on forever. 
forever. If I if I was previously at 110x and now I'm 100x, there's no way I'm giving up that 10x. I'm going to hold my bags until it goes back up to that 10x. So what you need to do is make sure you have that plan in place. Now, what sort of plans can you take? The simplest one is every x x move on your portfolio, you take some profit. That could be 20% if you don't want to take it. So the higher the percentage is, the more risk you're taking on. You've got a high risk tolerance, make it 2x. In this sort of market, every time your portfolio 2x's, you take a set amount of profit. If you want, make that 20%. So that it's a very personal thing. Every trade, every investment is personally personal. Where are you in life? Do you have commitments to your families? Um, do you have people you need to take care of? Are you trying to save up for a house? Is your goal to go on this big holiday? What is your purpose? What is your why for that money? Understand that. And then you're no longer a slave to the market. You're using the market to accomplish your goals rather than just going with the flow and being a part of the market. So that's what you need to understand from a personal perspective. So I've given you the percentage move. Also, you can use basic um, technical analysis tools, or I mean, I guess it's not a technical analysis tool, but trading tools, trading stop losses. Just pick a distance, just like with the percentage change, the bigger the distance, the more risk you're taking on. If you think it's an aggressive market that's gonna continue trending up with a lot of volatility, you can put a wide trading stop loss and just let it follow up. Or you can actually leverage other markets to take, stra um, take profits. For example, I don't know if people are familiar with rebalancing. So you can actually compare the performance of the crypto market to your other assets. Now, I know some people here are 100% crypto, which I get, I understand, fair enough. It's difficult not to be. The other day I was like, why don't I liquid every, liquidate everything else I have and just throw it into these DeFi protocols? I've been there. I go through it every single day. But that's the thing. Like, If you have other investments, you can start rebalancing into them. So every time your crypto portfolio starts significantly outperforming them, you start rebalancing. And what that does is it allows you to concentrate your wealth into crypto and then start spreading it out into other um, areas and start generating returns there, building yourself more of a floor. Uh, so yeah, those, that would be my advice for taking profit. That's a good responsible note to end on. Um, so we can move on to some questions from the chat. If anyone else has any more um feel free to pop them in there um, yeah we've, we've got a few in the chat I, honestly I, I think what you said so far Karush has been absolutely golden you know I think these are things that people get the impression of what a trader really does but you know really explaining it like on paper and saying this is what it really is like and this is what you need to think about I think that's that's so golden so thanks so much for that so far I really appreciate that, Brandon. Uh, and it is Im important to lay it out simply because I think trading really isn't that complex um, or investing. It it's so much more emotional and uh, patience-based because I mean, what you guys, most people in this chat are studying right now is so much more complex and difficult than trading from like a um, academic or intellectual perspective. But when it comes to that emotional side, that's what separates traders and investors. Yeah. So as always, yeah, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and um, you can unmute yourself. But for the time being, we have a few in the chat. So um, Yusuf asks, uh, how does the current landscape of new low time preference uh, institutional investors such as Tesla or other companies impact the longevity of this cycle? Um, you know, is it going to dampen volatility once the cycle tops out or do we end up having multi mini cycles within a greater cycle? I guess we kind of touched on this earlier, but it'd be great to have some more insight into this. Well, that's a fantastic um, question that raises the point that I mean, crypto is still early. It's still small. It's not just government regulation that we have to worry about, but the fact that any large ent entity can move the market. Because the governments haven't regulated yet, there's a lot people can do without having to worry about it. For example, Michael Saylor or Elon Musk, they could dump all of their Bitcoin onto the market and there's nothing we could do about it. So um, we don't, it really depends on what they're going to do and we have to be prepared for it. I have no clue right now whether Elon Musk plans to hold Bitcoin and then meme into Dogecoin and let that pump up into uh, forever, or he's just planning on actually using it as a sensible part of his company's portfolio. So really, 
Guys, I can't tell you what they're planning on doing with their investments. What I can tell you is that's what's part of the risk. That's what's part of the space being so risky, which gives us that sort of upside potential. So given it's never happened before, I'm ready, prepared for the worst, but hoping for the best. So what we've got two sides here. Number one, this is a short-term play. People start leaving and we lose a bunch of money or the price tanks. Hopefully we've got stop losses in place and we don't take a hit. Number two, though, it becomes a trend. People start following. More and more companies start flooding in. So, I mean, that would be my answer to that. It's just part of the risk and I have no clue what Elon Musk or any of these large institutions coming in are planning to do. I imagine they are individually very different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, we've got a few, I guess. Fergus, are there any you want to pick out as well from the chat? Let me have a look. Yeah, so there's a question from Neil about um, about transaction costs. I know we touched on the ETH gas fees earlier. So how do we resolve the contradiction between those who want higher prices as an asset and the sector needing low transaction costs in order to drive increased use? Well, there are actually solutions being built right now. Layer two solutions, which allow you to transact much cheaper on these networks. So they're not fully utilized or implemented right now. And the costs are a huge issue. And there's no way we can stop the prices going up for the costs to not be there. So yeah, that's a huge barrier to entry, but it is being solved right now. Layer two solutions are things built on top of the Ethereum network that allow you to transact simply. And this is because I've been talking to a lot of DeFi people and asked that exact same question to them recently. Awesome. And then Eleanor then goes on to ask, oh, NFTs. Yeah, I've just discovered NFTs as well. I think it's, it's amazing. <laughs> so I had a specific question regarding NFTs that I'd really appreciate an answer to. I, hopefully you'll get it, Eleanor. Because the art world is basically on supply and demand and an intrinsic feature is scarcity, what keeps an artist from limiting their supply? Like if an artist limits their NFTs to 10 and all 10 of them get sold, maybe the price will go up in the future. But what prevents the artist from making more tokens because he or she would not care about resale value if they're not making any money anymore? So thank you. That's actually quite an interesting, interesting point. I haven't thought yeah. about it that way. I mean, it's a fantastic point. I guess I'd leverage the example of um, what if an artist makes a limited edition um, 100 t-shirts for their first 100 fans. So it's an up and coming artist. And then later down the line, they're huge. And they're like, I'm going to remake that t-shirt. You can, but it damages your brand. It damages your integrity. And if you remake them, it's going to hurt your audience as well. So that's just going to change from person to person. There's some people who do business with um, love for their brand, with morals and ethics, and there's some people who don't. And um, short term, they might make a bit of money, but long term, no one's really going to win like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great answer. And Judith asks, does collaboration exist in this world? I assume in the world of trading? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, um, um, does collaboration exist in the world uh, of trading? Uh, what, what does collaboration mean specifically? Like, do people form groups and trade together? Um, do people, I mean, I mean, there's multiple forms. I'm not sure quite how to answer that one, Brandon. Yeah, uh, neither am I. I guess you could say we're collaborating now because, you know, you're <laughs> passing on your amazing insights. Um, and Zach goes on, this is actually a common topic that many people talk about, especially institutional investors who are getting interested in ESG demands and things like that is, do you see the energy demands of mining cryptocurrency limiting their growth potential, especially in a more environmentally conscious world? I mean, uh, there are cryptocurrencies that don't rely on um, high energy costs to mine, but it is one of the... Um, 
issues with Bitcoin, definitely something I'm conscious of. I don't think it's significant enough to long term have a, a, a huge impact, especially because um, that is something which can be done on renewable energy as well. There are more and more uh, crypto, like you're incentivized to be energy efficient right now. I'm not sure people saw, but um, in Russia, they've recently invested a disgusting amount of money making uh, mining farms, farms in Siberia, simply because it lowers the energy cost. And given that lowering the energy cost and doing it as efficiently as possible is the best way to go forward. Hopefully that helps with it, but still not a complete solution. And it definitely is an issue. Awesome. And Reese pops in just now, how much of your technical analysis is on-chain versus off-chain? Oh, that's amazing. So recently I've been, um, well, previously entirely off chain, but more and more this year, networking and finding other people who have different types of alpha. I mean, as traders and investors, we're just constantly high hunting for alpha. Um, I, I'll give a shout out to uh, CryptoQuant and Ki Yongju, someone I'm pretty close with and learning a lot, um, leveraging his on-chain insights. So I do use him as another confluence factor when I make decisions um, around my trading portfolio. And he's got really great information as well. So if you guys want more on on-chain uh, analysis, definitely check him out. Sweet, sweet. Yeah, I think that's actually quite, quite an interesting factor that not many people really consider, you know, when they're just coming into the spaces, oh, the price is going up, look at the charts. But now it's turning into this huge machine with this huge energy bearing load. And as yeah. a, you've already mentioned it, you know, it can really change things. So that's all there is in the chat. I'm just going to check if anyone has raised their hand. No. And I know, Fergus, you've got a ton of questions still um, you'd love to ask as well. <laughs> yeah, I think there's one more just come into the chat. Um, yeah. Which so is... Elliot uh, asks, what is the biggest between... Uh, I guess, what is the biggest difference between day trading crypto and conventional stocks? Well, I don't actively trade conventional stocks, but I'll leverage the example of a lot of people I know who do. And uh, crypto is the easiest poker table to play at right now. Uh, the market's a lot more inefficient. It's also a 24 um, seven market. So you're trading all the time. Uh, that's the biggest difference. Uh, there's a lot more alpha on crypto. It's a lot easier to trade. It's a lot more volatile as well, um, a lot less regulated. Uh, and then on the flip side as well, there aren't as many sophisticated participants, though that is changing at a disgustingly rapid pace right now. So that would be my quick answer to the differences. Yeah, I can ask some, uh, some more questions now. Um, the first one I think I'd go for is looking at kind of, um, you know, Bitcoin dominance and 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 the altcoin market. A lot of people are always, you know, sort of screaming out, screaming out for all season. What what do you think about Bitcoin dominance? Where do you think it's going, kind of in the short term and the long term? Because you you look at Bitcoin and Ethereum breaking out together. Um, how do you kind of think the the ETH Bitcoin market will will develop later in the year? Where do you potentially see um, Bitcoin dominance topping out? And, and you know, when do you think all coins will kind of go even. Um, Bitcoin dominance isn't something I actively monitor or pay that much attention to. It's more uh, the flow of movement between the different assets. Uh, I think you, anyone who's active on social media with uh, regards to cryptocurrencies will have seen this. It normally starts with Bitcoin leading the move. So Bitcoin will pump up to whatever it does. And then slowly Ethereum comes after. Then after Ethereum, it moves to the mid cap coins going up and then selective small caps. So with the danger with small caps is not every single one tends to go up. It's less of a dark board market. It's you have to be a little more selective and you need to spot narratives better. That's why DeFi and NFT type projects, they tend to pump every single time when it gets to the end part of that cycle. So I pay attention more to those sorts of moves. Like when Bitcoin moves, what happens? People get interested, the media attention comes in, they open up coin market cap or they go on Coinbase and they're like, oh, that's Bitcoin, but here's Ethereum. Ethereum is cheaper and it hasn't gone yet. Maybe I'm not too late to this boat. And then they get into Ethereum. Then the next wave come in. Okay, Bitcoin's pumped. Ethereum's pumped as well. Where's the next wave? 
and they come back down. And that's generally why it tends to move like that alongside other reasons, of course. But um, so that's more what I pay attention to, uh, the flow of movement. And it's actually a pretty effective strategy if you position yourself right after you see Bitcoin move. When you see the entire market cap pump up, the wealth gets distributed across the rest of the crypto market. So you can definitely build effective systems around that hypothesis. Yeah, you talk about people looking for for kind of the unpumped coins and thinking about sort of uh, people outside of crypto coming in. What what do you think about about Dogecoin? And um, I know a lot of people. That's kind of the one that a lot of people a lot of people ask about. A lot of people love it. And, what, and more specifically, what do you think about kind of Elon Musk? contribution in that sense do you think it's do you think it's a good thing or a, or a bad thing for the space i know a lot of people love it because it's kind of bringing the masses to crypto but equally it's sort of making a meme of the whole thing at the same time um so what's your thing on that you know what it kills me um i get friends who i've been telling for years hey this crypto thing's quite cool don't buy loads of it but you should have some exposure you're young and there's a lot of upside they text me like hey man i've been involved in crypto recently i think it's awesome i love this i'm like amazing what have you been getting into i bought dogecoin and it's up 7x and um in that regard it's a bit damaging for the space because um you buy dogecoin and that isn't that much infrastructure being built around Dogecoin right now. So I doubt it's going to be what gets adopted because like the difference between Dogecoin and Bitcoin is, I guess, people, you know, like there isn't that much difference. It's worth as much as people are saying it's going to be worth. But Bitcoin has a lot of infrastructure built around it. It's been around longer. So when you have Bitcoin, you um, are less likely to have it drop to zero. And when we do get these crazy movements, it makes the market look bad. That's why there's a, a bit of responsibility when um, large people do try to get involved in the space, reach out to influencers, traders, funds. Um, the more they pump and dump, the longer it's going to take for adoption to come into place. The more people are going to be hurt rather than have a positive, ex positive experience when they get involved in cryptocurrencies. So in that regard, I really don't like it for the space. Um, why Elon Musk is doing it, I have no clue um i honestly think he thinks it's funny but yeah I, I have no clue what elon musk is thinking uh with regards to dogecoin i don't think it's the best for the space but um yeah it is what it is yeah it's interesting to say that because I'm, I'm i'm pretty sure there's not even any active developers working on <laughs> um which is interesting oh, we've got another question in the chat um which is about security so would you recommend having you know kind of most holdings on a on a ledger or or some sort of hardware wallet rather than exchange accounts? Um, you know, do you do you see them as safe enough for holding kind of large quantities of crypto assets in sh in the short medium term? Sort of. So, um, it's a bit of a difficult question there. Um, the simple answer is there is nowhere safer than uh, in a hardware wallet, and there is also a philosophical factor of being able to own your own keys. That is the fundamental difference between one system and another. In this one, you are in complete control. There is no bank that can cut off access to your funds. And when you put that money on an exchange, you're not really doing anything but changing the centralized party. On the other hand, more and more sophisticated insurance products are coming out. Most exchanges are insured up to a certain amount. Um, there are DeFi protocols coming out for insurance. So if, you've, um, if you're holding money right now on... Um, on a platform where you're earning interest, on uh, exchange where you're providing liquidity or trading, you can actually get insurance on, on that. So there are solutions around it. And most exchanges, uh, the ones that are time tested, like you're taking on the risk of it getting hacked because it's happened before. But at the same time, a lot of these hacks get compensated and uh, there are more and more sophisticated protocols coming in place to protect your money on exchanges. So I personally am comfortable holding a large portion of my money on an exchange at this point, but I do, like there is no doubt whatsoever that your money is safer on a hardware wallet than on an exchange. And uh, bear in mind, there are risks to a hardware wallet as well. Make sure you keep it in a fireproof, waterproof safe. Make sure you have proper backups to your keys. Uh, there's a lot more onus and responsibility on yourself. So in a case where you're not the most tech savvy person, you might mess up the setup because the UI isn't that easy on a lot of these wallets. Uh, you might be safer on, uh, safer off trusting that exchange. So there are definitely two sides to the argument. Basically, yes, a hardware wallet is fair, is safer, but in practice, for a lot of people, exchanges might be a better option. 
Great. And there's another question now from Reese, which is, what's your favorite developer chain? Um, my favorite developer chain. Um, I don't really have a favorite developer chain, I guess. Yes, that's a fair answer. <laughs> um, I suppose you might not, I don't know if you feel comfortable shilling coins, but are there any coins? I've been trying to avoid it throughout I most, if, in case that hasn't been noticed. <laughs> <laughs> are there any coins from a, from a kind of a fundamental perspective, though, that you may be... Um, aside from Bitcoin and Ethereum that perhaps you kind of believe in um, long term without, without. You know, I mean, uh, I can talk a little bit because I've spoken about this on YouTube about how I position myself, what position, position myself for 2021. I had a very simple strategy. I was bullish on uh, the DeFi narrative and therefore I primarily still hold Bitcoin because I think the entire space is attached to it. I view Bitcoin as the index fund of crypto. Uh, I don't like taking an index of the top 10 because the turnover is pretty high. So you actually underperform versus just holding Bitcoin if you try to use traditional strategies there. Uh, so what I did is primarily Bitcoin, that's my exposure to the big crypto market. Then Ethereum and Chainlink. They're both highly involved in the DeFi space. Most apps are being built on Ethereum. Um, 414 companies are using uh, Chainlink right now as well. So that gives me extra exposure. And again, Ethereum's got a bigger market cap. It's been around longer. That's got less risk. I hold more of that. Link. And then I look at DeFi indexes because previously, although now I'm shifting as I'm getting more in the space, I don't really have an edge on picking the right DeFi project. So I take that humble approach. Let's take an index. There's multiple ones available. Um, FTX Exchange have one. Um, there is a DeFi Pulse Index and a whole others you guys can go check out. And you get exposure to the whole DeFi market without having to pick specific coins. Now, as I'm gaining more experience, I'm starting to pick more specific coins. I'm speaking to the right people, learning about it. Uh, so yeah, that is the closest I'll get to giving any specific recommendations. That's the strategy I've taken going into 2021. Great, thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to make you reveal your bags. Um, <laughs> a few more questions. No. Yeah, no, I think that's it, and I think we're good for time to wrap up as well. Awesome. Well, I hope that's delivered some sort of value to you guys, especially on the investing and trading side, because when it comes to the deep te um, technicals of the projects, definitely not my strongest suit, but hopefully still everyone learns a little bit. We'll get a little bit more into crypto, start checking out these amazing um, passive income earning products, opportunities in the market, and even better, getting involved in the space, guys. Like crypto is looking for talent right now and it's hungry. There are job offerings all over the place at the top companies. So if you want to get involved please um uh, uh, or definitely encourage it great well thank you so much for joining us um you've definitely given us a lot of value and uh given us some great insight into into the market as well as into kind of the strategies um can be used for investing and trading so just again thank you very much from me um and everyone at the society for joining us it's been great to have you yeah, My massive pleasure, thank you. Massive thank you, Kurosh. It's, it's been brilliant. You've, you've spoiled us. You've absolutely <laughs> spoiled us. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm really glad it's delivered value. And um, yeah, I guess, uh, uh, guessing that's the end. That that's is. the end. So I, for anyone who's still around, we've got another event coming up next week where we have a talk from Satra Gabali from Kaiko. They do on-chain analytics. Um, That'll be in the newsletter, uh, and this will be uploaded as well to our YouTube channel uh, eventually when uh, we all get time to do it. But yeah, I just can't iterate how valuable this has been. So thanks again, Karush, and thanks, Fergus, as well, for sorting this out as well. It's been a great event and uh, some solid questions in the chat, which is what we like to see. No yeah. worries. Um, one... Thank you, Ollie, for being on camera, because it's nice <laughs> to see faces as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Ollie. <laughs> Hey guys, I, I do actually have a meeting, so I am going to bounce. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Hey, what's up, Jackson and Jackson's friend? Uh, nice <laughs> to see you guys as well. Hey, another friend. This is great to see you guys. Love seeing the faces. Sweet. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, Fergus, let's stay in touch. Anyone wants to reach out to me, just DM me on Twitter. Uh, anything you want to talk about, feel free to um, just tell me you're from the Oxford talk, and I definitely won't ignore it. Bye, guys. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. See everyone uh, next time. And cheers for that, Fergus. That was great. Nice.
Nice one, Ferg. <laughs>